Coming. Last time we discussed reliable communication over unreliable channels. And the idea was that we were taking noisy channels and imagining fixing up those unreliable channels by putting an encoding system in front and a decoding system after the channel. And we discussed a toy example of a noisy channel, namely the binary symmetric channel, which flips a fraction f of the bits. And we discussed a couple of simple ways of encoding, a couple of simple ways of adding redundancy, namely repetition codes, and then the 7-4 Hamming code, which is a more sophisticated way of adding redundancy. And we discussed how to decode those. And so the idea is the encoder is adding redundancy, and then the decoder is using inference to try and figure out what happened and clean up the errors. And I introduced you to a result that we will prove in due course, which is, I think, one of the most remarkable pieces of mathematics of the last century, namely Shannon's noisy channel coding theorem, which says that if you add redundancy in a cunning way, you don't actually need to add very much redundancy to be able to achieve arbitrarily low probability of error. So for the binary symmetric channel that's flipping 10% of the bits, the boundary between achievable and non-achievable places um, on this diagram of rate and final error probability meets the axis at this rate C, the capacity, which is about 0.53, and that's saying you only need to use a rate one-half code. You only need to add 100% redundancy, and then you can have as small an error probability as you want. So that's amazing, and we'll prove it in a few lectures' time. But first, let's discuss where this fits into the, the big picture. Real data sources are usually redundant themselves. So this picture that I showed you last time, where we take the source and we add some redundancy, may not be quite the right thing to do if the source we started with already had some redundancy. So, for example, in English text, if what we're compressing is English, vowels and consonants occur with particular frequencies that are context-dependent, and that's something that we could learn about and exploit. And let me show you an example of this. Here's a piece of English with progressively increasing fractions of it erased. And uh, a volunteer, perhaps, could help us read this. And if anyone can read it successfully, then that's evidence that we can cope with some erasures. So it's evidence that the original text had redundancy in it. So it's some Jane Austen. Would anyone like to have a go at reading it for us? Come on, don't be shy. Yes. Uh, Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence. And they had lived nearly 21 years in a world with very little to distress or vex her. Uh, she was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early, no, early uh, period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe. Well done. Thank you. So, what erasure rate were we up to there? About one third of the characters are erased in this row. So very early period, her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses. <laughs> and, and then it's getting a bit hard. So that is an illustration just using a human expert of the redundancy that you can cope with some erasures. So real English text has redundancy. So how does that fit in the uh, the big picture. Um, whoops. Here's the correct decoding. So well done. The big picture 
in a standard communication system, what we want to do is exploit that redundancy that already exists in a real source and get rid of it and shrink the file. So we compress it first and make an idealized source that we can then put into the channel coding method that we were discussing last time. So we'll add the right sort of redundancy for the channel um, with our encoder uh, that we discussed last time, but we're going to wrap that whole thing inside a compressor and then an uncompressor. So we're going to talk about data compression and we'll spend a few lectures on this topic. So this is the conventional way of doing things. It's not essential that you have to do channel coding. Uh, those are upside down, source coding and channel coding. Okay, ignore, ignore that slide. Let's draw it in the right. So it should say source coding and channel coding like that. So we have our compressor and our uncompressor. And then we'll have the channel code, the encoder that's designed to add the right sort of redundancy to help us communicate over the noisy channel. And then we have a decoder for the channel. And as long as that does a perfect job, then we have what's coming out of here being the same as what went in there. So that's the game plan. So we call this source coding or data compression and we want to understand how to do that. In order to discuss compression, it may be helpful to think about idealized sources of redundant data. So we can think about compressing things that are idealized and, and simple. And the first example I'm going to talk about is the bent coin. And the bent coin is going to have an outcome and we're going to get lots of outcomes. And the outcome lives in an alphabet and the alphabet has two characters in it, one called tails, one called heads, and the probabilities of those two outcomes are 90% chance of a tail and a 10% chance of a head. And my notation is I'll call the random variable x and the probability that x is tails is 0.9. So this is the sort of notation I use in the book for random variables. And the sort of question we want to ask about this redundant source, it's redundant because it's got a hell of a lot of zeros and not very many ones. We want to understand better um, if we get a file made up of, say, 1,000 outcomes from this source, so we toss the bent coin a thousand times. How much information does that string of outcomes have? And how should we go about compressing that string of outcomes? And finally, what is the smallest possible compressed file size that we should be aiming for? And we'd like to answer this question for any random variable. This is just a, a simple example. In general, I'll use this notation, an ensemble, which will have a capital letter, say x, is three things. It's a random variable, an alphabet, and a probability distribution. So, a random variable, which I'll show with a lowercase letter, a set of possible outcomes which we'll call the alphabet A1, A2, A3, AI where I is the number of things in the alphabet and a set of probabilities
P capital X made up of P1, P2, P I such that the probability that X is a I is P I and these probabilities have the property that the sum of all of them is 1 and they're all positive or 0. So that's a general source of random outcomes of which the bent coin is one example and we're going to discuss the bent coin and some other examples and as we discuss them we're going to examine a claim this is Shannon's claim that the right way to measure information content and the right way to say how much should we expect to be able to compress things is as follows we're going to define a thing called the Shannon information content the Shannon information content of an outcome and here I'll talk about just a single outcome for this general ensemble where we get the random variable and it turns out to be AI the Shannon information content of that outcome is H of the outcome equals log base 2 1 over the probability of that outcome and we measure that in bits okay log 1 over P Shannon says that's the right way to measure information content when something happens you can say aha I have gained this much information and you get that measure of information content by looking at the probability and taking log one over it what does that look like well if you tell me what the probability of your outcome was P Shannon is saying that the information content is biggest for the really improbable outcomes and smallest for things that we're certain about in fact if something was definitely going to happen if it had probability one then it's got zero information content if it had a probability of a half then it's got an information content of one bit if something happens that has a probability of 0.9 like for example getting a tail from our bent coin that's got that's got an information content of log base 2 1 over 0 0.9 which is 0 0.15 so Shannon says whenever you get a tail from the bent coin you've gained 15 hundredths of a bit whereas when the exciting things happen the rarer events over here we get log base 2 1 over 0 0.1 bits which is 3.3 bits okay so he says every head every one in this file on the screen is giving you three and a bit bits of information content so he's claiming this is the right way to measure information content and moreover it's the compressed file length that we should aspire to so when we invent compression systems H of X is the compressed file length to which we should aspire okay so that's Shannon's claim and I'll carry on calling this the Shannon information content until you're convinced of that and then I'll stop using that name and I'll just call it the information content because we will have established that it really is the right way 
to measure information. Okay, let's now give ourselves, um, what should we do? Let's just make some observations about the Shannon information content. Notice fact one. This Shannon information content is additive for independent random variables. Okay, so hey, you're asking what do I mean by this? Yeah. Okay, this was really shorthand for an outcome. So I put an outcome in there. So that should have said H equals something or other. Okay. I'll try and be fairly thorough with notation, but if you get too bogged down in notation, then it's not fun anymore. So I'm, I'm going to hope that we're clear enough without being too obsessive. Okay. So. The information content, the Shannon information content, is additive for independent random variables. For example, if I've got an ensemble that I'll call XY, which, where the outcome from a single draw is a pair of random variables, X, Y, with the probability distribution P of X, Y is P of X times P of Y for all X and y, that's the definition of independent, if we take that ensemble, then the shown information content of the random variables taking on particular values, and I'll use a shorthand here, h of x and y, that means the outcome x being whatever x is and y being whatever it is, is log base 2, 1 over the probability of that outcome, which is log base 2, 1 over p of x, plus log base 2, 1 over p of y, substituting this independence property in here and using the way logs work. Okay. So, for example, if I get out my bent coin and toss it, and that's X, and if Y is, I open the door and find out if it's raining or not, and I tell you the pair, X, Y, I tell you state of the coin and whether it's raining, those are two variables that you probably believe are independent, and it sort of makes sense that the amount of information I am giving you, if I tell you them simultaneously, that it's tails and it's not raining, is the same as the information you would have got if separately I told you about one random variable and the other random variable. Okay. The other thing to notice, which I already sketched over there, is that the information content, the Shannon information content, is biggest for improbable outcomes. Okay, let's now define another quantity. We haven't proved this is the right way to measure information yet. We'll give some examples in a moment, but let's just assume that it is. And we'll we can then define another, another quantity, which is going to be called the entropy. And this is the property of the ensemble. The entropy of an ensemble is the average Shannon information content. And we'll write it like this. Capital H of capital X. And we get it by summing over all possible values of the random variable. X, P of X 
log base 2 1 over p of x and like the channel information content we call the units this is measured in bits okay so let's have a think about an example to think about these assertions that this is a good uh, good idea that the, these quantities are are sensible quantities let's look at the weighing problem which i gave you last time to think about and let's think about strategies for solving the weighing problem so please turn to your neighbor now and have a chat about your solutions to the weighing problem okay so the goal is given 12 balls one of which is known to be odd either heavy or light but we don't know which to use this balance as few times as possible and guarantee that we're going to find the odd ball and whether it's heavy or light so who's got a strategy that will do just hands up if you've got a strategy for solving um, this problem okay quite a few people grand I'd like you to answer this question. My method needs at most how many weighings? Have a think about your method. If you're sure that after you've used the balance seven times, then definitely you will have, you can guarantee you will have identified the odd ball, then please answer seven, etc. Okay, so hands up if your method needs at most 13 or a bigger number of weighings. Okay, 12, 11, 10, nine eight oh this is impressive seven okay couple that six five can anyone do it in four okay one and four can anyone do it in three okay apologies we had a technical glitch at this point the number of people who could do this weighing problem in three weighings was three. What I then moved on to was I asked everyone what their strategy was for the first weighing. And the choices are that you can weigh six against six, leaving none of the balls on the table. One person chose that as their first weighing. Or you could have five against five, leaving two on the table. That wasn't a popular choice. Third, you could weigh four balls against four, leaving four on the table. Twenty people chose that as their first weighing. Also, you could have three against three and leave six on the table. One person chose that. Two against two, leaving eight balls on the table. Or one ball against one, uh, leaving ten balls on the table. Those options weren't popular. Having identified those possible options as, as the first weighing, I then asked the question, what would Shannon advise you to do? Well, Shannon would say, if you want to get the most information on average out of your first weighing, maybe you should put, pick the first weighing such that the outcome of that weighing has the biggest possible entropy. And what we're about to do now is go through each of those six possible cases and work out what the entropy is of the outcome if you choose to, for example, weigh six against six. And that's the first case we now discuss. Let's backtrack and let's imagine that we weigh 6 against 6. Then the possible outcomes when we're weighing 6 against 6 are this, this, and this. So that's our alphabet. And what are the probabilities of these three outcomes? Anyone? Half, zero, half. Okay. And what's the entropy of that probability distribution? Entropy is the entropy of a half a half, plot it up, and you get one bit. Okay, so let's make a little note of that somewhere. If we do six against six, then the first outcome gives us one bit. Okay, five versus five wasn't very popular. 
Uh, but if we had gone with five against five, then what's the probability that it would have balanced? Put five against five and leave two on the table. What's the probability of that outcome? One sixth? One sixth. Why one sixth? Okay, so it will balance if one of these balls on the table is the odd ball, and that's two of the balls out of a total of 12. So it's a 2 12th chance, which is 1 6th. And by symmetry, the remaining probability is shared out. The remaining 10 twelfths is equally between these. So 5 twelfths for this, 5 twelfths for that. And the entropy of the outcome in this case if we weighed 5 against 5, I have worked out for you in advance is 1.48 bits. So Shannon says that gives you more information. It's curious that no one went for that. Uh, but what else could we do? Well, we could weigh 4 against 4. If we weigh 4 against 4, then what's the probability that it will balance? Someone else? One third. Okay, so there's one third chance, which is four twelfths, because it'll balance if one of the four balls on the table is the odd ball. And then the remaining eight twelfths is split between this and this. Okay, so four versus four gives you the entropy of a third, a third, a third, which is log base two of three, which is 1.58 bits. If we weigh 3 against 3, then what's the probability that it balances? We've left 6 on the table. What's the probability of this outcome? Someone else. Half. Okay, and so there must be a quarter chance of each of these. And when you work out the entropy, you get a half times 2 plus a half times 1, which is 1.5 bits. And so on. Let me fill in the remaining possibilities. If you weigh 2 against 2, then the entropy is 1.25 bits. If you weigh 1 against 1, the entropy is 0 0.82. So, something we could have done, if we believed in Shannon, was just say, well, what's the entropy for these different possible actions we could take? Let's just go with, with the one that maximizes the information content, and that would have sent us to this choice, which maybe after some thought, many of you have arrived at. Good. All right, let's go ahead and go with that choice. And so we've got some balls now, which we could say are possibly light, possibly light, possibly light, or possibly heavy, if this outcome here occurs. And um, what should we call these? Um, these are good balls, G. Okay. So that's one possible thing that could happen. A possible outcome, assuming we weigh four against four, is the left side goes up, the right side goes down, and we've got four balls on the table, which we now know are good balls. So, who'd like to make a suggestion? Let's get a bunch of suggestions of what we would do next if this here were the outcome. Have a chat to your neighbour um, and let's get some suggestions of what we do next. Okay, who'd like to suggest something? Goss? Well, you could weigh it against um, the other group and then you get one bit of information which will tell you whether it's heavy or lighter, maybe you could do that later. 
We weigh what against the, the other group? Okay. Okay, so you could weigh four goods against the four possibly lights. Okay, suggestion number two. Tell, tell me again, what's the, your suggestion now? Three good ones and three of the light ones. Okay. And then weigh them. And you get both. So if there are any that you can narrowly find before, if you have it, then you know whether it's healthy or not. Okay, let's not leap to, the, to all the reasoning we're going to have to work with. But that's a, a nice suggestion as well. Any other suggestions? And then we'll, we'll have a think about um, probabilities in due course. Yeah? How many? Two heavies, one light on one side, and then, um, then maybe the other two, two more heavies and what? And a light? Okay. All right, so in this case, we're leaving on the table a possibly light and four possibly heavy dudes. Here, you're suggesting leaving both lights on the table along with the, the goods. Okay, uh, that's some nice suggestions. Let's now have a think about them and think about the possible things that could happen. So, if we were to go for this strategy as our second weighing, all the goods on one side and all the possibly lights on the other, then what could happen? Could it look like that? Could that happen? Could the right hand side go down? No? Why not? So these ones are all possibly light, and the only way that that side could go down, given that the left-hand balls are all good, is if one of these four was the oddball and heavy, but we already know that's not possible. These are, guys can only be the oddball if they're light. So this has probability zero. Is it possible they could balance? Only if it's one of the, heavy, the possibly heavy guys. What's the probability of that being the case? Half. Half, okay. And what's the probability of that happening? A half. Okay, so that's a probability distribution whose entropy is one bit. Okay, let's talk through this one here. Okay, it's a nice symmetric situation, isn't it? Um, let's talk about the symmetric outcome. What's the probability of it balancing? A quarter or two eighths, because if the oddball is one of these two, then it'll balance. Okay. So, by symmetry, the remaining probability has to be split between the others. Are we happy with the symmetry argument? Three-eighths, three-eighths. For example, this could happen if this guy is the oddball and is therefore lighter than normal, or if one of the, either of those is the oddball and they're heavy. Okay. So that's another possible action and its probability distribution. And here's another action. So we could weigh three goods against three lights. So what's the probability that this will balance? Five-eighths. 
because there's five possibly odd balls that we've left on the table and if any of them is the odd ball then it's going to balance. What's the probability that it will do this down on the left and up on the right? Half? <laughs> What's half plus five eighths? <laughs> Okay, it's three eighths and zero is the probability of getting this outcome here because there's no way that the possibly light guys could be heavier than the good guys. Right, so we've got a whole bunch of possible things we can do and every one of them is leading to a different probability distribution. Here's one probability distribution, here's another, and here's another. And this one has a, an entropy that is actually a little bit less than one bit. Um, this one has an entropy that's going to be bigger than one bit. And I wonder if I can dig out what it is. <laughs> I've mislaid the actual value of it, but it's uh, actually a little bit bigger than 1.5 bits. Do we have any other suggestions of possible things we could do at this stage given that this was the first outcome of the first weighing? Any other suggestions? Yeah. Okay. Four good against three light and one heavy. So That could balance, it could go that way, and it could go this way. Right, we've left on the table a light dude and three possibly heavy dudes. So what's the probability that it's going to balance? Don't be shy. A half, because if any of these four possibly odd guys is the odd guy, then it's going to balance. All right. What's the probability that it'll do this? The right-hand side down. Right-hand side down, left-hand side up. One-eighth. One because the only way that could happen is if the oddball is this particular H that we put in. And what's left over? Three-eighths. So there's yet another probability distribution. Let's have another suggestion. Do, do you think this has got the biggest entropy so far of all these options? So we could just imagine trusting Shannon. If I give you an alphabet of size i, and I ask you, P1, P2, up to PI, you get a free choice of those probabilities. And your goal is to maximize H of X. What probability vector maximizes the entropy? Have a chat to your neighbor. Okay, so that's a little maths problem. What's the answer? How do we maximize some of PI log base 2, one of PI with respect to the probability vector P? What do we do with P? Anyone? Goss? Uniform. So you set all of them equal to 1 over I. Okay, so if I give you some cake and I say this cake consists of eight pieces and you've got three children and you've got to share out the cake as fairly as you possibly can between the three children but you can't cut up the pieces. Um, 
what's the best way to do that? Do you give zero to one child, four pieces to one and four to another, which is what we'd be doing here. Yeah, well, that's the rule, actually. You, you do have to give all the cake to the children. So, is that the most uniform way of showing the cake out? No. Uh, three, two, and three. That's looking quite uniform, isn't it? What have we got here? One piece for one, four for another, and three for another. And no one suggested a strategy, but it's a very common um, thing for people to suggest that you weigh something against something that gives rise to the probabilities four eighths, two eighths, and two eighths. That's a very popular thing to do. And my guess would be um, quite a few of you who chose four against four as your first weighing, maybe your next step had a choice of weighing that actually gives rise to this sort of distribution. Shall I give an example? What's an example? Um, maybe I should have asked for another volunteer to suggest something. Someone wants to suggest and we'll just see if it works. H H L L. Two H's on one side, two L's on the other. Brilliant. Say it again. You get four eights, two eights, two eights, but the four eights is, in, is, in, is the balance one. Okay. So. I'm going to slightly change your suggestion, actually, because I think if we put all the possibly heavies on one side and all the possibly lights on the other side, then one outcome definitely can't happen, namely that. But if I do it like that, an H and an L, an H and an L, all right? I've left two H's and two L's on the table, so balancing has a probability of four eighths, and then by symmetry, the other outcomes have a probability of a quarter each. Okay, so that's a way of getting two pieces of cake for one child, four for another, and two for another. And that's very fair, isn't it? That's got an entropy of 1.5 bits. So, here's the neat idea. How about we trust Shannon? And we say, okay, we're not going to do that because that's not as uniform. And Shannon says you should go for a uniform probability distribution. Okay? So this is short circuiting, having to think hard. You just say, let's use the entropy. And the entropy tells you, hey, do this. So do any weighing that maximizes the entropy. This one doesn't perfectly maximize the entropy because you can't exactly get a uniform distribution when things come in eighths and there's going to be three of them. But Shannon says, go for that, all right? And if you go, go ahead and do that, and then use the same method at your next weighing to pick a, um, an action that still gives you the most possible expected information, you'll be done in three weighings, okay? So, this is our first success of using Shannon's idea. I won't prove it to you, but feel free to go ahead and try, and you can try and break it, and we've only done it for this outcome here. If you want, you can go through this, uh, this possible outcome as well and think, okay, what would Shannon have you do in this case? What you'll find is Shannon will get you there in three weighings. All right, questions, yes? You haven't considered whether the information is relevant to the answer we're looking for. Ah, yes. Good. Good. So the comment is, you could imagine a world in which you could do an experiment that tells you all about the colors of the balls. And that's irrelevant to finding which one is the, the, the heavy one. And so this strategy isn't necessarily going to work. Because in that sort of world where you say, oh, choose the action that gives you maximum information content. What are you going to do? You're going to grab one of those old televisions and switch it on and stare at all the black and white stuff fizzing away on the screen, because that has lots of information content. So you're right. It's got to be relevant information content. And in this particular case here, the only information you can generate is relevant information content. So we, we were lucky. So yes, this is a strategy for solving um, problems, puzzles like this. Um, you really do need information about what's relevant. And that's, that's the, real, the real message. OK. Any other questions? Yes? Um, I don't know if there's a direct example in this, but you could argue, you could envision a situation where 
So your first test is one which enables a second test which has a lot of information guaranteed. So can you, is it, I'm not asking to prove this here, but is it, is it provable that by just basically going through it and picking the path the most information will ultimately optimize the system? Okay, that's a very good question. So you could imagine choosing a first weighing that Shannon says, brilliant, you got lots of information from that, but it gets you into some sort of dead end. So you have a greedy strategy that isn't the best overall strategy because your, your first choice may have been nice and informative, but then you're, you're sort of stuck. Yes, there exist puzzles that are like that. So I'm not telling you to always use a greedy strategy. I'm not saying always make your first measurement definitely be one with maximum information content. It's just an interesting rule of thumb to follow. And for this puzzle, it gets you there in three weighings, boom, just like that. So a beautiful thing about information theory is it can make your life much easier. You just have a, a well-defined objective function that can be a very helpful guide to what you do. But you're absolutely right. In general, problems like this can have difficulties if you go for a greedy strategy. So do take care. All right, any other questions? So, let's now go back to our idealized source that we talked about at the beginning, namely the bent coin. So the bent coin comes up heads 10% of the time and tails 90% of the time. And I'm gonna give you a puzzle to think about for next time. So it's called the bent coin lottery. And here's the way the bent coin lottery works. It's rather like the national lottery. But to get the winning ticket, instead of using a load of balls and drawing some balls out, we just take a single bent coin and we toss it a thousand times. Okay. So the outcome of that thousand long sequence of tosses is a string x1, x2, up to xn. And so here's an example of a possible outcome that might happen. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now, before they draw that outcome by tossing the coin, you can go to the lottery hut and buy tickets. And each ticket, they're all available to you, each ticket is a great long string of zeros and ones ordered. Okay, so you can buy the all zeros ticket if you want. You can buy any of the two to the n possible tickets. And one, once everyone has decided which tickets they're buying, if you own the ticket that has X on it, where X is the outcome that actually happened, then you win a million pounds. Sorry, a billion pounds. That's inflation. You get a billion pounds, and anyone who has that ticket gets a billion pounds. All right, so it's not shared. You don't need to worry about sharing with other people. So, um, the question I'd like you to think about for next time is, if a mafia boss says, ha-ha, we are going to take advantage of this lottery, we're going to ensure that we get a large amount of money, we're going to get a billion pounds, I will give you um, mafia funds, and you must go and buy a lot of tickets to ensure that we win a billion. Which tickets would you buy? So the rule from your mafia boss is to have a 99% chance of winning the lottery, and minimizing the cost to the Mafia boss, because you don't want to rip him off, which tickets would you buy from the ticket selling hut? Okay, that's question one. Which tickets do you buy to get a 99% chance of winning? And secondly, how many tickets would you then have bought? All right, please express your answer in the form two to the power something. So that's a task for you to do before the next lecture. And I'd also like to mention possible homework you could be doing. If this were a course for real with supervisions and exams and so forth, I would be recommending the following exercises, and I hope you'll find them fun. The first exercise we would do for a supervision is please invent your own error correcting code for the binary symmetric channel. This is going back to the previous lecture now. Remember the binary symmetric channel, we looked at repetition codes, we looked at the Hamming code. I'd like you to invent another code for the binary symmetric channel. Invent your own code and invent a decoding algorithm for your code. And estimate the probability of error of the decoding 
and encoding system that you've defined there. And if you don't like the binary symmetric channel, feel free to invent your own channel and invent a code for that channel. So make a problem and be creative and come up with some solutions. And in the book, there are some more exercises which you might want to do, which are listed up there. And finally, I'd like you to read not only chapter one, which was last week's lecture notes, but chapters two and four. Next time, we'll look at a few more examples and we will try and ram home the view that the Shannon information content really is the right way to measure information content. Thanks for coming. See you next week.